everyone. Welcome to the 401k Marketing Podcast. Are you ready to be the go-to expert in the retirement plan community? Listen in as we share ideas, resources, and best practices that you can use to professionalize your firm, demonstrate your authority, and earn more 401k business. Hi, everyone. Welcome to today's 401k Marketing Podcast. I am so excited to welcome our esteemed guest, Matt Holleran. He is the co-founder of Proudmouth, which if you haven't heard of Proudmouth, they are the podcasting go-to company in all of financial services. So welcome, Matt, to the podcast. Thank you for having me. Well, let's dive in. Um, Matt, you are a very accomplished and experienced podcast interviewer, and you hold the trophy for over 3,000 podcast guests and interviews. Wow, that's a lot. So for the folks who are listening here today, just share a couple of wonderful tidbits that you've learned in the process of interviewing people. Well, I think the first thing that you need to get very, very comfortable with is you're going to suck when you start. Right? And so I really want to make sure that all of your listeners understand that it's really okay to, to not start off being an absolute pro. And in fact, it actually helps you build a relationship with your listeners because they they see your improvements along the journey. If you go back and listen to you know the first couple of episodes that Kirk and I did of the Top Advisor Marketing Podcast, they were just terrible. Uh, we kept them and we just kept growing grinding it out. And now we're, you know, 460 episodes of just that show later. And the other, the other thing that, so I'm going to give you two things very quickly. The other one is it's a show and people really need to remember that you have to bring the energy. You have to bring the intensity. You have to practice. You have to warm up. Rebecca, I have a whole warm up thing that I do before I knew we were going to record today. So I did my warm up. I've got an exercise bike over here that I get on. I jump around a little bit. I do some vocal stuff. I actually sing just to warm my voice up. I reviewed the questions that you sent so that when I show up on a show, whether it's mine or somebody's like yours, that I want to put on a good show. I want to be prepared. I want to have the right energy and I want to come across as the expert that I really want to come across at on, on your show. I love that. To, uh, to quote my dad, which I have a lot of folks here has probably heard this before. It's prior preparation prevents Piss poor performance is the real <laughs> acronym. Uh, everyone always takes that middle part out. But as you said, it's a show and we're having fun. So yeah. <laughs> uh, yeah, I think that's the secret to life too. Show up prepared and ready. And thank you. That's awesome yeah. advice for anyone here who is interested in starting a podcast. Uh, in the beginning, it, it might be a little rocky and that's okay. Lean into it. Uh, I know definitely when we first started, I was overly prepared a lot of times. Uh, so that way that would calm myself down. Mm -hmm. uh, and I think that's one of the keys that people can take into being successful in the long term. And don't give up either. So you said you're 400 and... 60 episodes, yeah. My goodness. So, so don't give up either. So keep keep fighting the good fight. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> well, I, I also think it's really important too. So if, if you have a guest too, one of the other big things that I've learned over, over the last, because the majority of those episodes are actually me interviewing other people. And then all of the other podcasts that I have in the can are all me interviewing other people. One of the other big things too, is to really be able to control your guest, right? And one of the smartest things that you can do is before you hit record, make sure that their shoulders have dropped. So Rebecca, I'm sure that you've experienced this before with guests, they come in and their shoulders are up and you can tell that they're nervous, right? And like they, maybe they're, they're, they're clenching a little bit bit or they're furrowing their brow, any of those things that you can physically see means that it's really manifesting inside of them. So one of the things that I really try to do is I try to get my guests to relax and I actually don't hit record until their shoulders drop. Now, some people come in like you did on our show when I, cause I just recorded with you recently. You're, you, you know how to do this. You were already in the right state of mind. I could tell by how you were carrying yourself. We hit record and we just went, but there have been other times, Rebecca, where it's 15 minutes where I'm just trying to get them to breathe and calm down enough to realize. And once those shoulders drop, sister, I hit record. Nice. All right. That's also great feedback too. So pay attention to the person that you're interviewing. If you have guests on your show and what their body language is showing you. Great. I love this advice. So we've already learned nuggets of gold from Matt. Um, <laughs> uh, in our prep call, you had mentioned that in your years of experience, you've kind of honed in 
on five secret questions that you can ask, and it almost immediately helps you earn and establish trust. Do you yeah. mind sharing what those five questions are? Yeah. So, so the the cool thing about it is a lot of these questions uh, have have morphed over time, and so so one one of the one of my favorite questions is well, well first off there are categories of these questions, right? So that's also important to understand. So the the first one is it, they have to be open-ended, right? You never, ever, 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 ever want to ask a yes or no question on a podcast because what's going to happen <laughs> is they're going to say yes. And then there's nothing after that. Uh, so then you have to, you know, figure out how you're going to ask all the follow-up questions. But one of my favorite things always, always, always is tell me your story. Now I, now I do this in the pre-record call tell me your story in three minutes or less. And so I'm doing that, Rebecca, for a very specific reason. Number one, because I'm forcing them to understand that we are under a time constraint and that I don't want them to just be waxing philosophical forever. And it also forces them to really, really reflect. In fact, my favorite thing about podcasting entirely is one of my ultimate goals for every recording I do is that somebody learns something about themselves that they didn't know before they came into the interview. And I do believe by asking really, really good questions uh, you can go ahead and do that. Uh, the, one of the other ones that that uh, that I, I absolutely love to ask is I, I love to ask questions about something that they're proud of, right? Because it, it some because you it's it's a, almost like a black and white switch. Like some people hate that word, like oh I don't want to come across as being prideful, and then there's other people who are like, man, I've really worked hard at this. And I love managing that between, because if the people don't want to be prideful, I have an entire technique for that. And if they are going to be prideful and then they all of a sudden get maybe a little bit more boastful than they should, I have a technique for that too. And so I absolutely love those, those questions. One of the other things that I just absolutely love to say is tell me more. So it's not a question, it's just that open-ended thing that I'm just trying to, you know, solicit or elicit more, uh, solicit is the right word there, uh, pull more information out of out of my guest. Uh, so then I think, I think that puts us at three or four. And then my favorite is favorite is favorite is question is it's an old Columbo trick. And uh, so this this is a uh, police officers do this all the time. And there was a great television show called The Mayor of Easttown. So what happens is, is you get done with the questions and you start doing the closing of your show, right? Because most of us have a formatted closing, right? Which I do and I know you do, right? But in the middle of the closing, I actually will stop and I will say, um, what question should I have asked you that I didn't? So what happens, Rebecca, is they've already, they thought the episode, the, you know, the interview's over, right? Uh, I think it's all done. Uh, and then all of a sudden, I get raw, real, like visceral, cool, great, great answers. And that is my favorite question to ask. And I try to do it almost in every episode, which you would think people, like, were, they, they knew I was going to do that. But you catch them so off guard because they think the show's over. They're like, oh, man, Matt's not going to ask me that question. So they, they you know, again, they kind of relax and you can kind of see a little bit. And then all of a sudden I hit them with that question. And that is that almost always yields massive gold for content creation for our show. I love that. And as a retirement plan advisor, you could do that in your wrap up. Yes, so if you, you, you know, you're 50 minutes into a meeting and you're, you're saying like, you know, you thank you, appreciate that. Is there, and they just pause and say, is there anything else I should have, we should have discussed today? And then just wait. So the, it's the old sales technique too, Rebecca. And in fact, you and I talked about this many, many moons ago. It's the first person who talks loses, right? And so, I mean, loses, and I'm just kind of air quoting there, but you as the asker of that question have to be prepared. You might need to wait. I've, I've actually waited 90 seconds of dead air on a podcast, which of course we took out in post-production, 90 seconds before the person came up with the right, with, with what they thought I should ask. And here's the thing. When you're, when you're hanging out with your family, when you're talking to your team, when you're talking to the plan participants, when you're talking to anybody in the world of business, that question is gold because it shows that you, one, are humble, and two, know that you might have missed something that is very important to them. And I think that's just marketing gold. I love that. Thanks for sharing. That was, uh, I think everyone who's listening could benefit from that. It's You can even do it in your personal life, too. You're talking to your you know, spouse or partner and say, Hey, is there, is there anything I didn't, we didn't talk about today? 
You know, I bet you there's probably some dishes in the back of the <laughs> kitchen. <laughs> uh, well, Matt, in addition to your accomplished podcasting career, you, got, you are now joining the ranks of author. So tell us about this new book and how do we get it? Yeah, so so this is actually my third book, surprisingly enough. But here's the deal is very few people know about the first two, partially because of me and partially because of me. So so here's the deal. So I wrote the first book on social media for financial advisors called The Social Media Handbook for Financial Advisors, which is the worst title in the world. And I understand that. I didn't choose that. It was actually cho chosen by Bloomberg Finance, who actually wrote or who published the book for me. And, and the reason why that book really didn't do well is because by the time the book came out, 50% of what was in there wasn't good anymore because we were using screenshots and algorithmic things with LinkedIn, Twitter, and Facebook. Actually, it was Twitter back then. Mm -hmm. LinkedIn, Twitter, and Facebook. And uh, all of a sudden, so Bloomberg was like, nobody's buying this book. And I was like, well, it took you nine months from the time that you got it and everything changed. My second book was The 99 Best Marketing Ideas for Financial Advisors. The, the book itself, the idea was fantastic. It was going to be this cookbook of great 99 great ideas that advisors could just turn the page and say, I'm going to implement this into my practice but they screwed it up in printing. The artwork did not come across the way it was supposed to. And, and that one really flopped. So I'm not making any of those mistakes with this one. So this book is called Shut the F Up and Listen, How to Solve All of the World's Problems. And when you interview as many people as I have, and when you have the background and history of, of I was a therapist. Uh, before I was a therapist, I worked with at-risk teenage kids. Before that, I was actually worked in a hospital system where I did ethics. And so this one is a very, very personal book. In fact, it's actually makes me a little bit nervous, Rebecca, because this these are like a lot of stories I've never shared with anybody about very, very emotionally charged, impactful times where I realized that I didn't and shouldn't say anything. And when I gave myself permission to not be the smartest person in the room, these magical and wonderful things happen. So I go through all of these different types of listening that's all story-based in order for people to hopefully see themselves in the story, because I really truly believe everybody right now talks or listens to respond. They don't listen to listen. And that's the foundation of this entire book. And it's not as easy as just shutting up because not only do you have to quiet your mouth, but you have to learn how to quiet your mind. You have to learn how to quiet your body. And you have to also learn how to look for things and listen in a different way because a lot of what people are saying is actually the subtext of the words that are coming out of their mouth. And I teach you how to listen to that subtext. Cannot wait to, to dive into it. That sounds <laughs> incredible. That's... Well, I'm looking forward to it. And if you need a glowing review to help kickstart your, your Amazon likes, it's already a five-star in my book. I appreciate that. I really, <laughs> really do. Well, you've kind of shared a little bit of this already with the uh, first two books. But in this new book, what kind of surprised you the most about the process? And uh, if you were to reapproach mm. that? Well... So many, many moons ago, a, a person told me a quote from Ernest Hemingway. And actually, I don't know if he actually said this, but it is accredited to him, which is, if I'm not crying when I'm writing it, they're not crying when they're reading it. Which doesn't sound very Hemingway-esque, just so you know, but I love that. And so that was one of the things that I really brought to this book was I wanted when I was writing to actually recreate the emotions that I was feeling during these incredibly uh, heightened emotional states that I was in. And it just, just to give you a quick example, uh, one, one of the books or, or one of the stories in the book is about me in the ICU. So when you're an ethicist in the system that I was in, you had two jobs. One was education uh, and the other one was helping people make ethical decisions. And unfortunately, Rebecca, everybody I work with died. Right. And that's actually just the reality of, of what my life was then. Uh, so somebody had gotten into a really bad car accident. And so that was my client. Uh, and my job was to talk to the family and talk to the doctor and help the family make the decision that they need not what I wanted, but what they wanted. And talk about really having to remove yourself, any biases, uh, all of that sort of stuff. So the, the one of the stories in this book is about a, a young man who had gotten into a very, very bad car accident, very young. And her sister, uh, I met with his sister in the ICU 
and he was gone, right? He was being sustained by machines specifically. Mm -hmm. And so it was about that whole process of how I helped her arrive at the decision she needed to arrive at without really saying much at all. And, and so that's the sort of emotional. So when I was writing and I would bring myself back into that and, and I'm like sobbing, I, you know, there's a part, another time where I'm like really angry, you know, and I just wanted to bring that emotion into the book because I think that's what makes for a good story. Yeah. Yeah. Wow. That's going to be, I'll get the box of tissues ready. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> Looking forward to it. So, um, so it sounds like you've really done a soul searching job of pouring the emotions that you experienced into the words and that'll be powerful. Well, here's the deal. I don't think enough people do that with life, right? So you know, when, when you're presenting a financial plan or when you're going over, you know, long-term investment strategies with a company or with, you know, with any sort of, you know, person that you're working with in financial services, I, I think a lot of times that we really try to stay away from having emotionally charged conversations, but that's actually where real relationships are built. When you have that shared moment, that shared experience of, of, of joy, of laughter, of grief, of sadness, of excitement, whatever those things are, it doesn't always have to be, you know, because I know we do this a lot in financial services, a lot of crying, right? I get that. I've been in this industry for quite a while. But if you can bring hope and excitement and joy into your meetings and you're okay with sitting in those emotions, everything changes for you because now you're equating something that is so emotionally charged with the right emotion. And if you learn how to navigate that and you're going to be unstoppable, you're going to have clients for life. You're going to have referrals forever. But I think a lot of times, you know, advisors just try to be all buttoned up with their, you know, their pencil skirts and their, you know, uh, their ties and their ridiculous suits. I think they just miss that component. Good advice. <laughs> This is uh, one of my favorite questions. Speaking of favorite questions coming up, mm -hmm. um, if you could give yourself, younger self, uh, a few words of wisdom, what would you say to 20-year-old Matt? I think I was just actually talking to my son about this uh, last night, which is all happiness, all acceptance, all joy has to start from inside. So... I think so many people are always looking for external stimulus to make them happy. And I do believe that if you find happiness within yourself, then the world becomes a happier place. And you're able to make other people even happier because you have that foundation within yourself. I did not know that at 20. Holy crap. I made so many mistakes uh, with <laughs> stupid stuff, like, you know, buying myself all sorts of stuff I didn't need or being in relationships because I wasn't happy with myself. And, mm. you know, now at 51, one, you know, I look back at that sort of stuff and, and, you know, my wife says that I'm a golden retriever or a Labrador, <laughs> um, because, you know, I, I am fundamentally happy with who I am and where I am in my life. I have my own joy inside myself. I have my own love inside myself and my own happiness inside myself. And I think that when you have that, it becomes, uh, it kind of just emanates from you. And I, I wish more people gave themselves that gift. Something about quieting the ego that will change your life and listening humbly, listening to listen, just because. So in your, that's a great advice too. Um, what'd your son say? He said, dude, he said, that doesn't sound very easy, dad. And I was like, no, it took me like 20 years to figure out how to do it. But nobody ever told me that at 20, he had just turned 21. And so I was like, nobody ever told me that at 21. So, you know, my, my kids get earfuls of stuff all the time because their dad is a, a life coach and a philosophy major and, you know, uh, an interviewer and all of these sorts of things. So, man, they're getting it from all angles. But I didn't have that person in my life at that age. And so, you know, it's part of who I want to be for them. I love that. They're probably like rolling their eyes at you like, oh, yeah. dad, come on, seriously? <laughs> yeah, I'll take it all the time. Uh, so you've worked adjacent, and I'm using that word kind of on purpose, uh, with financial advisors for 30 20, 30? Uh, no. So, so I, I've been in it for about, about 15, 20 years. My partner has, he's, he's, sure. he's actually been in it for 30. So, yeah. Okay. Um, so he, Adjacent to financial advisors for 
call it a long time. A long time. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> we'll just go with that. It's easier. Yeah. Um, what characteristics have you noticed are reoccurring in successful financial advisors? Oh God, now that's a damn good question, sister. Holy crap. I actually don't think anybody's ever asked me that on a show like this. Wow. Well, I have an answer. It's control. So what, one of the things that makes a great financial professional, right? Whether, no matter what you do in financial services is, is that you want to maintain control. You have a high attention to detail and you want to make sure that things go well, especially for the long term. But that also makes you a really crappy business owner because you have to be able to delegate to other people and realize that there's a lot of things that are outside of your control that if you can delegate, trust who you're delegating to, and then also follow up with that person that you're delegating to make sure that you're doing those check-ins so you still feel like you at least understand what's happening even if you don't have that control. The advisors that I have seen that have just been unbelievably successful, it's that level of being able to hire the right people and step away mm -hmm. and say, I mean, it's like you, Rebecca. I mean, dear God, there's nobody in the 401k space like you, right? So, so being able to delegate to you, this is who you are. This is what you do. You are 401k marketing. You are that person. The advisors who will say, and I, we, you and I have talked about this before. Well, that's not how I would say it or that, you know, I just don't want what I want you to change everything. Well, hold on a second. Like, you know, you realize it like for us, just a, a proud mouth example, we've done 8,000 episodes, all right? Just in 80,000 social media posts with zero compliance issues for financial advisors. You're going to tell me that Joe Schmuckatelli from Iowa knows more about podcasting and marketing than our 8,000 episodes do? That's the level of control. And that's just in the world of marketing, but that has to do with your investment management process. That has to do with your hiring. It has to do with your team evaluations. It has to do with your client meetings, all of those sorts of things. The faster that you can rescind that control, and you said it a little while ago, it's it's that diminishing of the ego, right? Once you have that, once you are able to put yourself aside, everything changes in your business. Love it. All right. Well, if you are listening to today's wonderful podcast, and if you have questions, um, how can you reach Matt and his team to learn more? Yeah. So, so uh, follow me on LinkedIn, like much like you, man, we, we have a huge presence there. We're always putting out really free, great, actionable content. Or you can email uh, me at actually sales at proudmouth.com. Uh, that's another really good way to get a hold of me and my whole team here. But but honestly, if, if you connect with me and you message me on LinkedIn, I respond personally to every one of those. I don't have such a huge audience that I, I don't. In fact, a guy just messaged me. I, I don't know him, uh, but he's he followed me. He's like, hey, you know what? Uh, I was just listening to one of your podcasts and I, I need a podcast boom arm. What do you recommend? And I was like, I've already got that list. Bam, cut and paste a, you know, a link to an Amazon, you know, boom arm. And, and he was like, wow, dude, that was fast. I was like, what are you kidding? I, I answer these questions all the time. So uh, LinkedIn is really the best place to do it. I mean, if you're a big Twitter or X follower, you know, I'm Matt Haller and underscore, you can follow me there. And I'm sure that we can put those, those links in the show notes, but I, I really am here to help. I would love for you to utilize our services here, but our ultimate goal here at Proudmouth is very simple to help you stop being the best kept secret in your area by getting your voice out in the marketplace. And you can do that with audio. You can do that with video. You can do that with great custom written content. You just need to do it because so many people want what's in your brain and you just need to figure out how to get it out and get it out in the marketplace. I love it. All right. Well, one last question. Uh, what should I have asked you today? <laughs> Um, yeah, you know what? So you're going to let me walk through this door. So I'm going to take it. So here's the deal. You are fiduciarily responsible to provide education to plan participants. And we firmly believe that podcasting is an amazing way to provide very easy, very actionable, very portable content for your participants. And if you really want to look different than the 401k advisor down the street, guess what? They don't have podcasts. Do you know how I know? Because none of them are doing it. Very few of them are doing it. Now, there's some stars in 401k world who are podcasting a lot. Uh, and actually, Rebecca, I, you actually introduced me to a couple of them. But listen, that's such a wonderful way for you to scale that educational component. And we work really well with 401k marketing because the topics that they help you come out with for the 12-month plan uh, that they can help you build are perfect podcast topics too. So we play very nice in the sandbox with each other. 
And I really, truly believe that it's a great way for you to really make a real connection at scale with the thousands of people that you might need to communicate with on a regular basis. All right. Well, thanks, Matt, so much for joining today's podcast. Hopefully everyone took great value from those list of questions. Uh, get your Amazon carts ready for this new book coming up. And always remember right before the end of asking uh, in your client meetings, hey, is there anything else we should have covered today? So thanks again, Matt. Appreciate your time. You're always a joy. Thank you so much for listening to today's 401k marketing podcast. Click the subscribe button below to be notified when new episodes become available. The information covered and posted represents the views and opinions of our guests and does not necessarily represent the views or opinions of 401k marketing. The content has been available for informational and educational purposes only. We hope you enjoyed.